All right. Welcome, everyone. Second module on large-scale machine learning today. Uh, first of all, a couple of announcements. Homework 3 assignment 3 is due tonight. And likewise, we're going to be releasing homework 4 uh, later today. OK? And as usual, uh, keep on working on the gradient quizzes on a weekly basis. All right, what are we going to talk about today? So uh, on Tuesday, you recovered uh, the first set of techniques for large-scale machine learning that we are going to be talking about in CS246. So we have seen how to build decision trees, scale them uh, uh, for very big data sets. And we have been talking about this planet uh, system that has been developed by Google roughly 10 years ago. So today, instead, uh, we're going to be focusing more on SVMs, so support vector machines. I'm going to give you a, um, an overview about stochastic gradient descents, more advanced techniques based on that. And then at the end of the lecture, we're going to be seeing how to parallelize those techniques to work with very large data sets. But first of all, let's go through a very quick refresher about what is supervised uh, learning so that you know, we, don't, we don't get lost throughout the lecture. Uh, so once again, we, we would like to you know, uh, execute a, a prediction task. We have our function f of x, and we want to predict our label y. And our y can, be, can take many different shapes. It can be a real number. In that case, we have a regression problem. It can be categorical data. In that case, we have a classification task. And last but not the least, you can also be working with complex objects like ranking items, parse trees in NLP, and so forth. Okay? So there is a, a quite large. Uh, amount of different tasks that you can perform. The reason why it's called supervised learning is because we are provided with labels, at least in our training data, okay? So we have many pairs, x, y, x is our training instance, and y is the label. And especially today, we're going to be focusing on perhaps what is like the mother of all the classification tasks, which is binary classification, okay? So in our case, the y uh, class will take the shape of either a plus one or minus one label. And Towards the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you how powerful this kind of assumption is, because pretty much from a binary classifier, you can use it as a building block to then construct multi-class classification and so forth, OK? So being able to solve this task and do it fast then allows us to open up a lot of new scenarios, all right? OK, so um, now that we are given our, our training data, uh, I'm going to highlight once again what is the main crux of machine learning. Like, what, what can you do horribly wrong in machine learning, OK? So uh, we have x, our training data, y is our set of labels. And ultimately, what we want to do is we hope that our f of x generalizes so well that it's going to work uh, on predicting unknown uh, y prime values, OK? So basically, when we see new data, our x, y, but we have to be able to predict correctly our y prime labels, OK? So uh, this is uh, what is usually called in machine learning the training and test split. And the main mistake that you can do is to basically train on both the training and test data and then believe that your model is actually working correctly, OK? I know that you have heard this probably in five different machine learning courses, but it always helps uh, to, to hear it once again. So, what is our hope here? Basically, we want a model that can generalize. Okay? So generalization means I see unknown data, I've trained on our x and y sets, and I'm going to be doing a good job with y prime. Okay? And the main mistake here that we can do, apart from uh, the capital scene of training also on the test data, is the fact that we can uh, have our model learning so much um, the characteristic of the training data in such a way that it's going to be overfitting. So overfitting means that the model is going to learn each single uh, different peculiarity of our training data so that it will do a perfect job at predicting y. But then once it goes to work on y prime, all in a sudden it's going to be doing a very bad job. Okay? It means that the model is not generalizing and we are facing overfitting. Okay? So today we're going to be seeing how to make sure that uh, even in our support vector machines, we do a good job in terms of avoiding overfitting as much as possible. Now, let's try to formalize a bit more our setting. So say that uh, our training data is drawn independently at random uh, from a, a non-probability distribution P of x, y. And our learning algorithm, what it's going to do basically is analyzes all the examples and produces a classifier f. Okay? 
and once this classifier is given new data still drawn from P, the classifier is going to be able to predict our y hat uh, values. Why is it very important to highlight the fact that the new data is drawn from P? So this turns to be, in reality, a very strong assumption in machine learning, uh, especially in contexts like, I don't know, like companies receiving new data or receiving a different kind of traffic. Over time, the characteristic of the data tend to change, all right? So uh, we're going to be using this assumption today and pretty much throughout all the duration of the class. But I'm going to be giving you this hint that especially recently we're working on a lot of what are called online machine learning algorithms that are basically able to learn uh, data as it's ingested by the system and change the characteristics of the model, OK? But let's stick to this assumption for today. It's going to make things much easier. And as usual, we want to be able to measure something. We need a measure of the quality of our model. And we're going to be calling this the loss, OK? So the way in which we measure our loss is pretty much what is the difference between the actual labels of the data and the labels that we predict. Now, given the nature of the labels, say those are numbers or classes, we, we can compute loss in different ways, OK? It could be a mean square error. It could be uh, mismatch, uh, misclassifications, true positive, false positive, and so forth. What counts is that each model to be trained correctly must expose some kind of loss measure so that we can optimize uh, and we can minimize the loss of our model, OK? So as I was saying, the goal of our learning algorithm is to make sure that we find a function f such as we minimize the expected loss of our model, OK? So let's go through uh, the formula setting once again uh, with an architectural drawing. So we have our training data. Uh, as I was saying before, our training data is basically drawn at random from our uh, probability distribution p of x or y. And with the training set, we ingest it in the learning algorithm, and then we produce our function f as the classifier. And what, what we do here is that on top, we also have our test data on which we didn't train the algorithm, but it still has y labels. And what we're going to do is we're going to be comparing the predictions produced by our model, f, and the actual labels. Okay, so we put both of them together in our black box as a loss function. We compute it, and our goal once again is to minimize L. Okay, as simple as that. So <laughs> in reality, this is a hard task, and I, I basically summarize uh, all the challenges of machine learning in five minutes, as you as you might have realized. So why why is this once again extremely hard? Because when we do our estimation on F on our training data. We also want this to work well on unseen future test data. And as I was saying before, sometimes this unseen uh, future data looks very similar to the training data. So that is coming pretty much from the same probability distribution. Sometimes it's much different, all right? So that's why this is a very challenging problem. How do we minimize the loss now, OK? So, uh, once again, on top, we have our expected loss function. We want to minimize it. But as we said, we don't have access uh, to um, the labels in our test data. So what we're going to do is we're going to minimize the average loss on the training data. Okay? So we're just basically going to be taking the average. We have n instances in our training data. We compute the loss, and we, we minimize uh, the average. Okay? Now, what is the problem here in case uh, we don't understand what we're doing with our loss function? So say we just try to optimize it in any possible way. The most trivial and powerful way to optimize, to minimize this loss function, is to memorize all the labels in the training data. Okay? So basically, we can achieve zero loss on the training set just by memorizing each single label for our training data. Okay? So that, that is a very powerful and stupid classifier because it doesn't generalize, all right? But you will be surprised, especially in the past, there have been a lot of uh, papers or uh, studies published on you know, uh, large media outlets that were based on very ill-defined classifiers, OK? So always keep in mind that that's one of the other capital sins that you can commit while trying to minimize your loss function, OK? So we don't want to memorize training data. OK, so I think what I'm trying to do here is to convince you that overall, machine learning boils down to an optimization problem, 
Okay? Apart from the different models that we are going to be seeing, we'll be seeing decision trees on Tuesday, we're going to be seeing another different type of models today, but overall we know that there are different models in which you can capture characteristics of the data, but the important part is the fact that we have to optimize this model, otherwise it would have very poor performance, all right? So let's start working with a, uh, with a very simple model. So basically today we're going to be seeing models that are pre pretty much linear in their nature, okay? So we have a set of weights y, x is our data, we take the dot product, and then we have a bias term, and we're going to be seeing that pretty much already linear models are extremely powerful, and you can also work with i-dimensional data with them, okay? So that's going to be uh, mostly the, the focus for today. And uh, once again, now we can rewrite uh, the, the, the loss function that we had before in terms of expected loss on the training data. So once again, we're going to be taking the average on all the n instances on our training data sets, and now we, we express it in this way. So we're going to be taking the product of the weights and our training data. We compute the loss compared to the actual label for the, uh, for the instance i, okay, so we have y of i, which is our uh, label for the distance, and then we compute what is the loss, okay? So that's the function that we want to minimize today. Now, how do we express the loss? As I was telling you before, it can take different shapes. Uh, it depends on how the data looks like. Is it numerical data? Is it categorical data? I'm going to be showing you the, the very first kind of loss function that can come to your mind, okay? which is nothing but a stepwise constant loss function. And it works in the following way. So if there is an agreement between the label uh, predicted and the label in the actual data, so like you take the product between them and both of them are positive or both of them are negative, then you're gonna be seeing a positive value and our loss is zero, okay? As soon as there is a mismatch between the label that we predict and the actual label in the data, then the product is going to be negative, and then we're going to be seeing a loss of one, okay? What is the problem with this kind of function, which I kind of spoiled already uh, down here at the bottom of the slide, is the fact that it's very hard to take the derivative of this function. So it's going to be having derivative zero uh, in this uh, to discontinued part, and then it's going to have a derivative of infinite on when x, uh, when, uh, when x is equal to zero, okay? And as we're gonna be seeing later, uh, we also covered this during the latent factor lecture uh, in the Rexis module. Uh, you recall that the main ingredient that we use for gradient descent is the fact that we can differentiate that function so that we can walk down the gradient and quickly converge towards the minimum of our loss function. So the issue is we cannot really use a loss function that cannot be derived. Okay? Otherwise, this kind of peak at infinite here is not going to be making our life easy. So we're going to be seeing a variation of this function, okay? But at least this should already give you an idea of how a loss function can look like. Uh, so how are we going to approximate then uh, our loss? So we said that we want something smoother, so um, we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be basically replacing it with a surrogate loss function, for example, the hinge loss. So the hinge loss is probably the second most trivial loss function that you can think about. It's called hinge because it will remind you of a hinge of a door, and I'm going to be showing you the graph later on to make you realize why this is the case. So how does it look like? The rest of this equation is pretty much similar to before, so we're going to be averaging over all our uh, training instances, so our n instances in the training set, and then we're going to be taking either the max, the max between zero or one minus the actual prediction of our model. So what's, what is happening here? If the, the prediction and the label are matching and then their value is positive and large enough, then this value is going to be negative. Therefore, we're going to be taking zero. Okay, so our loss is zero. In case instead these two values are mismatching, so one of them is positive and the other one is negative, we're going to be coming up with a, a large, uh, uh, we're going to be having here a negative quantity, so there is a minus, this is going to become positive, and then this one, this one will be the loss in core Bauer model, okay? So that's why it's called hinge, and that's how it looks like. So the idea is, if our prediction is you know, we have high confidence that this is correct, and then we're going to be in this part of the plot, and our loss is going to be zero. Once we start to get close to the origin, 
So we're going to be incurring a small loss, okay? And the reason here is, you know, we are so close to the splitting point between uh, doing a, a, mis a misprediction that we're going to be slowly to start to slowly uh, start to increase our loss, and then the loss keeps on growing linearly, okay? So this is our hinge uh, coming from someone who had a lot of creativity when they wanted to name it, okay? Okay. So any questions up to now or? Shall we jump to the support vector machines, which is the first model for today? All right, so let's go to SVMs. So what is the, the concept behind an SVM and why are they exciting? Um, let me highlight uh, this fact first of all, once again. So uh, from Tuesday, you remember that we talked about decision trees. We said that they are amazing for many different reasons. They're fast, the model is compact, uh, they can capture no linearity in the data and so forth, so extremely powerful. The only shortcoming is the fact they don't do very well with high dimensional data. Usually what the decision tree expects is data that is already well pre-processed and where we have extracted features that are already extremely informative, okay? But there, are, there is a, you know, another side of the spectrum in machine learning where uh, you can feed data that is highly dimensional to your models. The first one you can think about is text. Okay, so you take a dictionary in the English language, you can, you know, cap it at 50k terms or 100k terms. That's very high dimensional data, okay? So you're going to be representing a document as a very high dimensional vector. In that case, decision trees don't do a very good job. So that's why today we're going to be seeing instead support vector machines, which conversely do very well also with high dimensional data. So the key idea here is we want to separate the plus from the minuses, okay? So this is now two-dimensional data. I do an effort in abstraction. You can think this as d-dimensional. And our plus and minuses are basically the labels, okay? So this is a binary classification task. And we just want to divide. We want to find a linear model that is going to split the plus and, and the minuses, okay? So uh, data, once again, we describe it as before. So it's always a tuple of x, the, the training coordinates, and y, uh, the label. And uh, in each example, the coordinates are going to be real valued clearly, and the label belongs to this set of minus one or plus one. And what we can do is basically we can take the, the inner product uh, once again. So W is the set of weights, X are the coordinates of our point in space. And what we can find here is basically what is going to be the best linear separator defined by our weights W and our term B. Okay, so this is basically the only parameters that we need to find in order to define the line that splits between the two uh, sets of data. Okay, so you can imagine that this is one candidate that does a good job at classifying. There, there will be many more of them. Okay, so you, you can imagine lots more lines splitting the plus and the minuses. So the task that we're going to be uh, working on today is finding which is the best line separating those points, okay? So uh, like which one do you think is uh, better in terms of a separator? This one or the top one? And the intuition here will be that, for instance, if we pick this one, uh, this plus sample is very close to the line. So this classification will have a very low confidence intuitively, okay? while this one is a much better split between the two sets because most of the points are very far from the line, okay? So we want to formalize how to find the line in an efficient way, okay? All right, so now we introduce the concept of margin. So how, how do we go from what I was saying in terms of distance to something that is a bit more formal that we can optimize for, okay? So we we're basically want to take the distance between the uh, separating uh, hyperplane. And this distance, we can think about it as the confidence of our prediction. So in our case, once again, like point A and B are predictions with very high confidence, Y, C will be a prediction with a very low confidence, okay? And we want to avoid as much as possible points like C. Okay, so we're gonna be calling our margin uh, gamma and what we're going to be taking uh, to be optimized is the distance of the closest, closest example from the decision line or our hyperplane. So you see, these are two potentially uh, good uh, separating hyperplanes, but we like 
the one on the right much more because if we take the instances that are the closest possible uh, to the separation line, their distance will be much farther compared to that case that we have on the left, okay? So we have to find basically a strategy on how to define the separating hyperplane. Uh, you might be wondering, why are we focusing exclusively on the distance of the closest example? Why aren't we working with the average, for, for instance? Like, we can take the average distance of all the points to our separating upper plane, and we can try to maximize that. Um, it's mostly for theoretical convenience, so if you go and read the papers and how, you know, uh, the fact that SVMs are working correctly has been proved, it makes life much easier to work uh, with this concept of the point uh, that is the closest to the separating other plane, okay? But the intuition pretty much stays the same. We want to make sure that the points are as far as possible for our separating line. So, a uh, short refresher on what is the dot product because we're going to be using it later on. So, if you want to take the dot product between A and B, uh, what we're doing is basically we take the normal vector A, the normal vector B, and the, uh, then we do the product of the cosine of the angle between them. And there is a geometrical interpretation that we're going to be using later, which is the fact that basically A, a dot B is going to be nothing but the projection of A over the vector B. Okay, so that's how we can we can imagine it, and you can compute it directly with this with this formula there. Um, so you can imagine that today we're going to be seeing a lot of geometrical interpretations of why that hyperplane uh, fits correctly and splits our training points. So that's why it's very useful to uh, think of the dot product in this way. All right. So now that we refresh this, uh, let's take some example of what is. What is a good margin? How, we, how can we pick a good uh, margin gamma? Uh, so first example here. This one is the origin. Then we have point x2 and x1. How do we compute the distance of those points to our uh, separating line? Okay, so we take the coordinate. And now what we can do is, this is the vector w that defines the upper plane. For As an assumption, we're going to always be working with uh, uh, a vector w of norm equal to 1, okay? And the way in which uh, we can compute the distance is that x1 is nothing but the projection over the vector uh, w, okay? So it's going to give us this distance to the upper plane. So in this case, you can think that the margin between x1 and the separating line is going to be roughly equal to the magnitude of w. Now you take x2, for instance, uh, instead, and in this case, the projection is much longer. So roughly, you can see that uh, we're talking about twice the norm of W, OK? So um, you can imagine that we're going to be doing this pretty much with all the points that are close to our separating line, and always make sure that we uh, maximize those distances. OK, so the bottom line is the bigger is our margin that we can find, the bigger is going to be the separation. Therefore, the bigger is going to be the confidence with which our classifier produces the, uh, the predictions. Now, let's be a bit more formal and let's start to see how do we compute the distance between the points and the, and the separating line. So we have our point A up there, coordinate are x sub 1, x, uh, x sub of A1 and x uh, sub of A2. Uh, then once again, we have our vector w that defines our splitting line. And once again, we assume that the norm is equal to 1, okay? So that's our origin. And let's take any point m on the line, okay? So on our uh, line, on our uh, line defined by the vector w. And this one is going to be having coordinate x sub of m1 and x sub of m2. How do we compute the distance between A and our uh, line L. So we're going to be calling that AH, OK? So the distance, which is nothing but the norm of AH, we can rewrite it in the following way. So it's going to be uh, A minus M, so our point here on the line uh, dot product W, OK? And the reason is here, because we're basically taking the projection. How can we rewrite this? Uh, once again, so let's remember that our point M, it belongs on our, on our line, so we can rewrite it in the following way. Remember that we have this expression of up here, that every point on the line follows this equation, right? 
uh, w uh, times x plus b equal to zero. So we can rewrite those coordinates and make it equals to minus b. So we're, we're carrying the b on the other side since we know that m belongs to L. So we take and we substitute our m in this way. We expand the equation and then we simplify. And what do we get? So we are getting, uh, we are keeping uh, b from the substitution and then the terms with m are disappearing. So we're just going to be having x a, uh, x sub a one times the weight one plus uh, the, the, the second term plus b. And that's how we go, uh, that's how we prove that the distance between a and our line hell is the dot product, is the product of the weights w and a plus b, okay? So now we, uh, we, have a four, we have an equation in our hands on how to compute the distance between our line and each point. And this is going to be the way in which basically we compute what is the margin, okay? And that's eventually what we're going to be trying to minimize. So um, how do we now compute the, how, how do we compute our predictions? So our prediction is nothing but the sign of this product, okay? So if, if the points are on the right side of the plane defined by our separating line, then the sign is going to be positive, okay? But if they are on the wrong side of the plane, then the sign is going to be negative, okay? And that's how basically we compute this. So we're just going to be taking the sign of this expression. And once again, the confidence is not about what we have just seen. So is the distance computed between the point and the separating line. So for each, uh, for each data point, we can compute the gamma margin. So we have data point i, and our gamma i is nothing but what we computed before, okay? Now, what do we want to solve? What, what kind of uh, loss are we trying to, uh, to optimize here? So this expression is a, is a bit tricky. Um, basically, what we want is we compute all the possible margins, okay? And the margins that we care about are those that are the closest to the line, okay? So let's say is this plus on top here, and then it's probably this minus here, okay? These are the two margins that we're worried about, are the two data points the closest possible to the separating line. Now, once we have this, what we wanna do is we wanna, after we, we pick the minimum margins, we wanna make sure that we maximize them, okay? We wanna make sure that the points that are closest, once again, to the separating line are as far as possible. So how do we maximize them? By tweaking the weights W and the value B, okay? So we're basically, we're gonna be finding the best possible parameters for this separating line such that the minimum margins are gonna be as large as possible. Now, given that the expression uh, uh, of this one is not very easy to optimize, we can instead rewrite it and we're gonna be rewriting it in the following way. So what we're doing is, we're trying to maximize uh, the margins given uh, the, value, the value of the weights w and our gamma value, such that for each, for, for each instance in our training set, all the, all, the, all, the margin, all, the, all the distances to the separating line are gonna be larger than our gamma, okay? And basically we took this minimum here and we carried it over in this, in this expression here, okay? So we're making sure that each distance is at least as large as our, as our minimum gamma, okay? And we wanna maximize this over all the possible gammas, okay? So it's just a trick to make sure that we have only one maximization, so that now we're gonna be able to optimize this expression, okay? Any questions? Okay, let's, let's go on, um, on defining then what is an SVM, okay? So now that we understood what kind of problem uh, we want to solve, uh, let me give you a first definition of why it's called a support vector machine. So we wanna, uh, we want once again define what is this line. And to define a line uh, or to define a separating upper plane in a d-dimensional space, we need d plus one vectors, okay? So for instance, in this case, we're working in 2D, we're gonna be needing three vectors to define what is the separating line, okay? And the way in which we define this vector, so the way in which we find the parameters uh, w and b for this line is by 
maximizing this expression that we have just seen, okay? So that's why it's called a support vector machine. It turns out that there are many different types of SVMs. What we're gonna be seeing today is the, is the first and pro possibly uh, least advanced form of a support vector machine because it works exclusively with a linear model. Okay? It turns out that there is a lot of additional work later on on SVNs where you can substitute a linear model with something that is called kernels, so you can have more advanced functions basically splitting your data. Okay? And you can imagine that this becomes much harder also in terms of finding what are the best possible margins. Okay? But the, the key idea of what we're trying to attempt with an SVM, even if we substitute a linear model with something more advanced, is still the same. We just want to separate our hyperspace in such a way that we find areas where all the uh, same labels uh, can be found clustered together, okay? Okay, now, how do we derive this margin, okay? How do we actually compute it so that in, uh, we can then optimize and find the, the correct values for it? So, once again, we wanna separate our upper plane and uh, the way in which we do it is defining by uh, our support vectors. So uh, we have our plus and minus points. Uh, so the red points and the blue points, you can imagine them, you know, uh, you just map them to uh, two classes that you like. And the, the key aspect here is that these don't have even to be points uh, uh, belonging to your training data. Okay, like this, this could be three fictitious points. The, the important thing is that we want to find these three support vectors that are gonna be defining um, our, our separating line, okay? So as I said before, we need D plus one support vectors for the dimensional data. And uh, while this problem is relatively easy to um, imagine right now because we're working in 2D, as soon as you start to feed it with, uh, let's say, English documents with a vocabulary of 50,000 dimensions, then all in a sudden, this becomes much harder, okay? But it's good to work uh, with this geometrical explanation on the side so that you can get the intuition of why uh, this is working, okay? Now, the problem here is uh, the following. So, if, you know, if you're trying to uh, maximize this value from the expression that we've seen before, what we could be doing is that we could just be boosting the weights in order to scale up the increased margin, okay? So uh, if we are putting you know, a constant in front of our weights and we make them twice larger or four times larger or 10 times larger, then our margins are growing as well, okay? But it turns out that this is not w what we want because this is similar to overfitting our data. You know, we, we're not really learning what is the best separator. We're just introducing a constant that uh, increases the size of our weights. So how, how do we find a workaround for that? We gotta make sure that we always work with, no with normalized weights, okay? So from now on, every time we are computing the margin, we make sure that we divide it by the norm of the, of the W vector, okay? So we, we always wanna make sure that that expression uh, is equal to one, okay? Okay, so in this way, basically we are, support, we, <coughs> we are recurring that our support vectors uh, are defined with this expression, okay? So uh, we have our separating line and then we're gonna be having uh, support vectors of norm just equal to one, okay? So if you take plus and minus one, basically we're gonna be having a parallel separating line on the left and another parallel one on the right assigned respectively to plus and minus one, and that's where we're gonna be uh, having our support vectors, okay? Perfect, so now that we have this, how do we, uh, how do we uh, find the solution for, for, for our problem, okay? So we, want, we said that we want to maximize uh, the margin. So for instance, what is now the relation between uh, x1 and x2, okay? So what is the relation between these two margins? So, we can write uh, x1 in the following way. So x1 is nothing but uh, x2 plus twice the margin going on the other side, okay? So we know that there is a distance of two between uh, the, the parallel line on the left and the parallel line on the right. What do we also know? So from what we have seen before is that we know that our support vectors all uh, will be expressed in this way. So it's either plus uh, one or minus one, depending on which side of the plane they are. 
So we can rewrite that expression in the following way, okay? So say we have the expression for uh, the first support vector, then we can go and we can substitute it from up here, okay? So this is the a way in which we can express x1. So we take this x1, we substitute it in here, and what we get is the following. So we, we distribute, uh, we, we just expand the expression, and we know that this is equal to minus one, okay? Because we have it up here, so we can substitute all of this to minus one, and that's what we get, okay? So we make sure that basically if we, if we do all the math, we see that our margin is always gonna be normalized to one uh, over the norm of W, okay? So in this way, we make sure that all the margins in here are equal to one, okay? And these are the margin of our support vectors. So now that we know how to express this in a canonical way, we can start to do the following. So let's go back to our problem from before. We wanna maximize our margin such that uh, uh, all the points are lying outside of the separating line. And we said that in this way we can be arbitrarily large, so that's why we normalize. Otherwise, we can basically just boost the weights for W and make this expression arbitrarily large, but that's not what we want. So how, do, how can we rewrite this? So we can take basically the arg max of gamma, okay? That's what we're trying to do. We want to maximize gamma. This we can rewrite as uh, the max of one over the norm of W. That's what we just uh, expressed from before. So that, that's what we just found out. We can now rewrite it in this way. So we take the reciprocal and this will become then the mean instead of the norm of W. And all these steps should be trivial because we derived all of them. The only one that uh, might look slightly uh, strange is this last step, okay? So we said that now we want to express this problem as the arg mean of uh, one over two uh, times the norm of W uh, to the power of two. Why do we want to do this? Uh, we're going to be seeing it in a little, while, a little while, but you can imagine that if you take the derivative of this expression, then this is going to be equal to just the norm of W, okay? So this is just a small trick that we're going to be carrying over so that once we plug this expression in our gradient descent, then all in a sudden we're going to be working again just with the norm of W, okay? So bear with me for a while, and then we're going to be using this expression uh, in that way so that it's going to make our life easier uh, for, the, uh, for the optimization. Okay, so we found a way to rewrite that. So we went from something that was depending on gamma to now something that just depends on the weights, okay, of basically the parameters that define our separating line. We, we made this trick so that after we can make sure that we can plug that into gradient descent and we're able to optimize it. And this is the expression that defines what we call an SVM with hard constraints. Why do you think we call it in this way? Like, what is one thing that uh, we haven't considered up to now? Like, this seems to be a very ideal example in life, right? We're always able to find a line that splits perfectly between uh, elements of one class and elements of another class. What, what do you think is here the assumption that we should relax right now? Sorry? Perfect, exactly. So this is what we're going to be doing right now. So the, the sets here are perfectly separable, uh, separable. And the, this property is called linear separability. And this is not clearly always the case, okay? Data tends to be very messy and noisy, so it's extremely hard to always find such a perfect separating line that gives us uh, pretty much no loss, okay? So from now on, we're gonna be relaxing those hard constraints and we're gonna be working with something that is also able to deal with more noisy data, all right? So for this reason, um, we need a concept of basically penalty. So if our data is non-separable, then we need a way to include that in our loss function, right? And the first way in which we can think about it is that we can account for the number of mistakes that the model is making, okay? So you can imagine, okay, we are in this case here. Uh, how many mistakes do we have? We have one, uh, we have one, two, so two uh, red minuses and one blue plus 
on the wrong sides of the plane, okay? So we know that apart from the uh, fact that we have to minimize uh, the, the margins so that we find the best possible separating line, we're also taking into account how many misclassifications we make. Um, this is a, a good start, let's call it in this way, but we can do much more, right? So you can imagine that a mis misclassification happening very close here is, is gonna be less problematic than a misclassification happening very farther away, okay? Because here we already know that the confidence of our classifications is very low, okay? Like these are data points for which it's hard to distinguish to which class they belong. While something that is completely in one side of the space separated by our upper plane should be relatively easier to uh, classify. So uh, that, that's why we're gonna be going from something that depends just on the number of mistakes to something rather than also capture the distance of those mistakes from our separating line, okay? Okay. So to do that, we're gonna be introducing a concept called slack variables. And these slack variables are doing nothing but encoding how far away these points are from the wrong side of the plane. Okay, so if, if a point is on the right side of the separating line, then we don't attach to it as slack variable. But once they are, then we're gonna be basically computing the distance from the separating line to where they actually are, okay? So basically, if for each data point, if the margin is larger than one, we just don't care, okay? If the margin is less than one, then we pay a linear penalty. Okay, as easy as that. So as we were saying before, the farther you are from the separating line, in case you, are, you lie in the wrong side of the plane, the more penalty we're gonna be paying. And what do we, what do we wanna do? We wanna basically include this in our uh, loss function, okay? So we're just gonna be adding a term there uh, that depends on C. So C is still the number of mistakes that we can make. And then we're, you, we are iterating on all the possible points. You see the sum goes up to M and for those, where there is, a, the, there is an error, then we're gonna be using uh, a slack variable that uh, encodes the linear penalty uh, in our model, okay? And the other change that we have to make, uh, everything stays the same, but here we're gonna also be including the value of the slack variable. W why do we do that? So basically, if we are on the wrong side, then we wanna, we wanna compute once again what is the distance to the separating line so that you wanna make sure that one minus the slack variable is gonna be bringing you to the right side of the plane, okay? So we're basically carrying the slack variable also down in, in that expression. And if we, if we minimize this problem, now we're gonna be able to find a model that not only takes into account what is the best separating line, but also takes into account the possible mistakes that it's, it's making, okay? As we were saying before though, this is relatively risky, and in which way? In the sense that if we try once again to optimize this too much, we might ending up overfit in the model. So let's, let's try to work first through, uh, through an example, through a visual example so that you get an idea uh, what is going on. So you can see that once again here we have the expression from before and we have this basically weight C that we put on top of it, okay? So, uh, if we put uh, C equal to zero, uh, then basically you can set the slack variables uh, to, to anything. And a model with, with that kind of uh, penalty value can basically fit any kind of separating line. Conversely, if we bring uh, C to infinite, we're gonna be making those mistakes extremely penalized, okay? And there is a chance that we are just not gonna be able to find a separating line that can minimize that expression. So. This is where we start to talk about overfitting in SVM. So if we have a standard C value, then most likely this is the kind of separating line that we're gonna be finding. But if we boost up that value, we're gonna be finding this separating line that actually does a perfect job in this case, but has very small confidence, okay, you see? Because it penalizes more mistakes, so it carries over to this side, but then we're gonna be producing some of these predictions that have very low confidence values, okay? And conversely, as we were saying before, if C is very small, then the model doesn't have anything to learn from because this slack variable allows a lot of slack to the model. So it can pretty much choose any set of weights. 
and then we're gonna be fitting a line that doesn't make any sense whatsoever, okay? So you can think about C as a regularizer, uh, as a regularization parameter for our model, okay? You might have seen that in other models in machine learning, pretty much every good model in machine learning allows you to have a tunable that tells you if you're overfitting or not, okay? No, the slack variable is the, is the distance between the, the separating line and uh, your actual value. So you, you, you can see it as the margin, but it is, not, uh, it is not the margin that we compute from like the closest point to the separating line, okay? It's just the distance of the misclassified points to the separating line. And you use that as a penalty value that is gonna be ending up in your loss function, okay? So you compute it only for the points that are misclassified, not for all of them, okay? Yeah? Sorry, a second question. Sure. So if W is always normalized to have a magnitude Y, then why are we even minimizing? Why are we? Oh, W, the norm is gonna be equal to one, but the components, that's what we are, we are looking for. Like we, we change the values of W to define a different line that then allows us to find the smallest possible um, penalty coming from those errors. So we, normalizing W just means that we make sure that the norm is always equal to one, but the value of the different components can vary, okay? So we vary the, the components of W to find the best possible separating line that brings down the penalties as much as possible, okay? Are we still minimizing the top function or are we ensuring the second yeah, we're minimizing the top function, and then we, we, this is a condition, right? It's such that per each training point, we want that condition to hold, okay? Perfect. Okay, so we've seen different trade-offs uh, with our uh, penalties. So now we can express a support vector machine in what is called usually its natural form. So by natural form, we mean something that now can capture both uh, the misclassifications, the fact that data is not linearly separable, and we're gonna be bringing everything together in one single uh, model, okay? So everything here should still look familiar, so we're trying to minimize this. Here we're just taking the dot product. Uh, this is how our regularizing factor, and then we're just gonna try uh, to maximize this expression that we have seen from before. So that is our margin. C, as I said before, is our regularization parameter, and this big sum is our empirical loss, okay? So it's how well we fit to the training data. And as uh, I introduced before, SVM is basically using the hinge loss, and you can recognize it from up there, so we're taking the max between zero and one minus the actual prediction, okay? So that's how we we are expressing that as the hinge loss. So we, we cannot work again with this stepwise function because we cannot derive it. So we're gonna be working with our hinge loss. And this is the compact version to express uh, the, the same loss function that we've seen from above, okay? So now that we derive this uh, beautiful formula, how do we make sure that uh, we, we can find, uh, we can actually compute the margin, okay? So how do we, uh, perform this estimate. So we want to, as I was saying before, we want to estimate both uh, the weights W and B, okay? So we wanna find what are the parameters that define uh, our separating hyperplane. And you can recognize that this is basically a quadratic function, right? Because you know, we have this product up there. So you will be tempted in just using a solver. Uh, we know that quadratic functions are very beautiful, they are convex, there is uh, one global minimum to find, so why not? And there, is, you know, there are a lot of software for finding uh, solutions to this kind of common optimization problems. You can throw this in MATLAB with a one-liner and it will do it for you. What is the potential issue here? Like, wh why don't we just use a solver and call it a day? What do you think is the shortcoming? Especially if you ever use a solver in your life, uh, you might remember why it's painful. <laughs> so solvers are extremely slow in general. They, they don't deal well with very large data. Um, 
there are a lot of people doing amazing research on solvers, so I, I'm, I'm not trying to <laughs> discourage the kind of work that they're doing. Uh, the solvers have improved a lot throughout the decades, uh, but still, you know, when they're facing the size of the data sets that you know, we even talk about in this course, they simply cannot scale to something that large. Um, so that's, that's the reason why, like minimizing a quadratic function, ideally uh, easy to do, uh, but it's, they are very inefficient for big data. So how do we find a solution to this? What is the workaround uh, that we can employ? Okay, so once again, uh, this is what we want to minimize, our uh, loss function j, and all the work that we have done before now puts us in a condition where we can actually take the derivative of that beautiful expression up there, okay? So why do we want the derivative? Once again, we're gonna be working with the, with the gradient. We just wanna uh, make sure that we can work down that function, uh, differentiate it, and then find the global minimum for, for our loss, okay? Very similar to what we've seen, I guess, in uh, week five, week four, when we were talking about the uh, latent factors in recommender systems, okay? So, we're going to take the derivative of the expression up there uh, pro, uh, on, uh, on W. So this is how it's going to be looking like. So that's the trick that we played before. We work with the square and we put one half in front. So once we take the derivative, that will just look W. Uh, to, um, and clearly we're going to be working with each single component of W. And this is the derivative of our empirical loss. Uh, so here is what we get once we compute uh, our gradient. So there are two different uh, things that can happen when we are deriving uh, this expression on top. So it could even be zero in case this condition holds. And you can see up there because we're basically taking the max of either zero of the expression on the right. So if it's equal to zero, then we know that this condition holds or uh, if we are taking the right side of our max, uh, then this is the, uh, this is the um, uh, derivative that we compute from there, okay? Like everything else is gonna be canceled because they're constants, so we're just left with minus y sub i x sub i j, okay? So now that we compute the derivative, you know, it depends on w, and it's either uh, zero or this value, we can plug, so we computed uh, our gradient, how can we use now gradient descent to find the minimum? So again, this should remind you of what uh, we've seen, I guess, uh, a week ago or so. And what we're gonna be doing is the following. So for each uh, dimension uh, of our data, okay? So we, eval we evaluate our gradient in the following way. So this is what we computed before, and then we update with a gradient step, okay? Uh, I think you implemented this also in homework two, so you remember that you can have different learning rates, eta, depending on what kind of value you choose there. Uh, our convergence rate can be faster or slower. It can become uh, unstable, as you have unfortunately found out during the homework, and so forth, okay? So basically, that is our learning rate parameter, and once again, C is our regularization parameter, okay? What was the problem with gradient descent? Like why, why do we like it, but why aren't we satisfied about it? Who wants to answer this? Yeah. Can you get stuck in local, local optimum? optimum? Exactly, you can get stuck in local optimum because it's missing the stochastic aspect and it's also very slow, right? So given that today we focus on the large scale subtle machine learning, I'm gonna be giving you some alternative to the standard gradient descent, okay? So this is still faster than using a solver in most of the times, but we, we need much more once the data is scaling even further, okay? So as I was saying, basically computing uh, our gradient takes linear time because what we're doing is we are, uh, we are iterating over all distances in our training data each single time, okay? So n is the size of our training data set. The more it grows, the more our uh, computation time for the gradient grows, okay? So not ideal for what we want to do. So there is, it, there is the reason why we need an alternative, and this alternative is called uh, stochastic gradient descent. And the key insight here is that instead of evaluating the gradient over all the examples that we're given, we evaluate it for each 
individual training example, okay? So we do just one training example at a time. And what's the only thing that changed from the expression before is that the summation over i is gone, okay? Otherwise, we're optimizing exactly the same function as before. And the pseudocode will be pretty much the same, but now this, what was before in the inner loop has come out in the outer loop, okay? So here we're iterating over the dimensions, and per each single uh, training uh, instance, we're gonna be doing one computation of the gradient and one update step, okay? And as we've seen, this tends to converge uh, faster, it's a bit more unstable, uh, but um, it has a lot of interesting properties, okay? Now, before we go and see one example of how well it performs, I also want to give you a couple of pointers on additional variations over gradient descent that have been, uh, become extremely uh, used, especially in the past few years, thanks to uh, deep learning, okay? So the first one is what is called the batch gradient descent, okay? And the good news is you're gonna be implementing a variation of this for your assignment four, okay? So you, you will get an idea of why uh, doing this kind of optimization is very powerful, okay? So um, in a batch gradient descent, we do, uh, we do the following. We calculate the error for each example in the training data set, but we update the model only after all the examples have been evaluated. Okay, and this is what is usually called a training epoch. So we go through all the points and then we do just one big update to our gradient, okay? So what are the pros? We're doing fewer updates compared to the gradient descent that we've seen before. And it also turns out that this can be also proven theoretically that the error gradient is more stable, okay? So it tends to have uh, a smoother uh, way of reaching uh, the minimum. Conversely, uh, the shortcomings are usually requires the whole data set in memory, and it's lower than SGD, okay? It's lower than the stochastic gradient descent. Like, nothing really beats the stochastic gradient descent in terms of sheer performance, because we're working just with one training instance at a time, so you, you cannot really make it cheaper than that, okay? But SGD comes with some shortcomings, so that's why uh, I'm talking to you about some possible alternatives, okay? Now, the, the big thing that we don't uh, like too much about the batch gradient descent is the fact that it requires the whole data set in memory. And once again, this is something that we cannot afford with the kind of data sets we talk about in this course. So, uh, rejoice, we have the mini batch gradient descent, which is a trade-off, basically. It's a middle ground between the standard uh, batch gradient descent and SGD. So what we do here is, uh, we are still working with the concept of batches, but one, in the case of uh, BGD, a batch is the full training data set. In the case of the mini batch gradient descent, it's usually a, a small multiple of two, okay? Like 32, 128, and so forth, okay? These are usual values that you can assign uh, to a mini batch gradient descent algorithm. And the nice property of this technique is the fact that it balances between the robustness of SGD and the efficiency of the batch gradient descent, okay? So this will not require as many updates as you perform with SGD because SGD will perform one update per uh, instance. And we're gonna be seeing later today why those updates are expensive, okay? Uh, like you, you might think that doing an SGD update is relatively cheap because you tend to be working a lot in local, but when you work with very large data sets, you have to maintain these a uh, large set of parameters for your models and the gradients in other servers. And these servers will be receiving a lot of different updates concurrently. So that's why this becomes only in a sudden extremely expensive to maintain, okay? Okay, so let's go quickly through an example so that I convince you why uh, these numbers are exciting and why uh, they make a big difference in terms of uh, how much you can scale. So uh, we take like a, a routers document corpus. So these are basically uh, news and announcements. And we have roughly 800,000 training examples. So documents, 23,000 test examples. As I was mentioning before, we're working with a, a very high dimensional data. Here you can see 50,000 features. These are mostly words, okay? So we basically capped the English dictionary to the 50,000 most uh, occurring uh, words. So we do one feature per word, we remove the stop words, we remove the low frequency words, and so forth, okay? So this is our very basic feature engineering that we perform on this data set. 
Uh, so what are the questions that we want to answer? The first one is uh, the most exciting, can SGD basically successfully minimize our loss function? And then how quickly is going to SGD find the minimum of our loss function? And last but not the least, what is the error on a test set? Now these three conditions, they all have to co coexist at the same time. You cannot find a way to optimize your model and then do very bad on the test set, okay? Because it, it totally defies the purpose of optimizing it with a faster technique, okay? So we want the three of them uh, to be holding at the same time. So let's go through this example. Uh, here is training uh, our standard SVM without SGD. And the training time is roughly six hours, seven hours, something like that. And, and this is our loss value, and this is our test error. And the good news is, uh, you can see that uh, we're experiencing basically a, a five orders of magnitude of difference between the standard one and the SGD version. So it takes roughly a second to, uh, to converge, and uh, the loss value is pretty much the same, and the test error is pretty much the same, okay? So we matched all the requirements that we had in mind before, and as you can see, this is extremely fast, and our test error is comparable, okay? So it's an example to convince you why uh, using SGD is the right way to go uh, with SVMs. And now in this plot, we are going to be seeing what is the trade-off between using a conventional SVM uh, trained with uh, gradient descent and one uh, that goes through the stochastic gradient descent. So the difference here is the following. If you want to have a very fast training time, um, then you want to be working with an SGD, okay? As you can see, you can quickly converge to, let's say, uh, an error of uh, loss to the 10 to the minus 5. The problem is, if you want to make sure that uh, uh, the precision of your solution goes all the way down here to 10 to the minus 9, then this is a solution that we can only reach with a standard gradient descent. It turns out that we rarely care about this, you know? We, we, we just want to make sure that our loss is small enough and we want to optimize this model as quickly as possible, okay? So that's why we have, uh, we have this, uh, this trade-off, okay? So basically, to optimize our loss function with a reasonable quality, then uh, uh, we know that our stochastic gradient descent approach is super fast. What this is capturing, basically, is think about this separation line in SVM that we were seeing before. We said that you can find plenty of them, okay? And by applying small tweaks, you can always possibly find a solution that is slightly more optimal compa compared to what SGD will do for you, okay? But this gives you very fast already a solution that is very good. And most of the times, this is just what you need in machine learning, you know? Because these models will never achieve 100% accuracy and 100% generalization, right? Because we said they can do as well as you want on training, but then they're not going to generalize perfectly to your test set. So trying to strive for this kind of solution is most of the time pointless. Okay, uh, I'll leave with some other practical consideration. We don't have time, but there are some other tricks in there in case you want to make your SGD go even faster. Um, now let's jump quickly to how uh, we can solve multi-class classification with SVMs. And this kind of intuition doesn't work only with SVMs. It works with a lot of different classifiers. The first one is, say we, now we want to classify three different classes. We have the pluses, the minuses, and the circles. Um, we, can do a, um, we can do one classifier per each class, okay? So th this will be, we basically, uh, oops, I lost my, my pointer, sorry. Uh, so the, the first idea is that we have one against all classifier, okay? So we're going to have the pluses versus the other classes. We train three different of them. We train them separately, and then we just classify by taking the majority voting of those classifiers. So this is one idea. The other one is that uh, you can also try to jointly learn together the three set of weights that are defining the, the separating lines, okay? So we, that we can find the three classes. I'm not going to go into the details on how to do this, but what I want to give you uh, right now is the intuition that, as you can see, as soon as your task becomes more advanced, your models are becoming more complicated, right? So now we're going to be having multiple classifiers, or we're going to be having to uh, find more weights in parallel, and this opens an outlet not only 
to be able to work with large data sets. That's what we have seen on Tuesday, like we have these large scale decision trees, but we also have to be able to work with very large models. Okay? So this should give the intuition that if you go from an SVM to something as a very large deep neural network, the complexity of your model grows a lot. And all of a sudden, you cannot store any more the parameters of your model in a single computer, and you cannot train anymore just on a single computer. You need more computational power to make this happen. Okay? So that's how we're going to be closing the lecture, and I'm going to be giving you a crash course so now you can parallelize uh, machine learning where all, uh, eventually you just need an optimization function, okay? So as I was saying before, ML boils down to this big uh, optimization problem, and how can we make sure that we can still perform an optimization when the model is very large and the data is very large? So we have seen very quickly this slide on Tuesday. I'm just going to give you a refresher. Um, so in 2017, Google kind of revisited a 15 years old experiment where they showed that uh, both the size of the data and the complexity of the model, they play a role in the performance that you can achieve with your machine learning pipeline. And they've done this with very famous deep learning models for computer vision. Like you can think of ImageNet and so forth. So what uh, what this plot shows you is the fact that uh, growing the number of examples, so the number of images, the performance is, is growing logarithmically. But at the same time, to be able to capture all the characteristics of such a large data set, you also have to grow the size of your machine learning model, okay? And this has become a very hot problem recently because now we learn how to have such expressive machine learning models. So we are going, you can think of the example we had before from a single SVM. You can start to have different kernels. You can start to work on multi-class problems and all of a sudden your model is growing. Now make this even worse and apply to deep learning and your network is going to be growing to uh, hundreds of millions of parameters. And all of a sudden this becomes another problem for scale, okay? So what I want to convince you today is that large data sets plus large machine learning model are what are leading us to amazing results, but how can we make sure that we can tackle both of these problems? So in the last lecture, we focus on decision trees and planet, and there mostly, that was the prime example for the data parallelism. So we said, we have our decision trees, how do we make sure that they scale to very large data sets? And we use MapReduce. Say, okay, now we can partition the data naturally among different servers. Each server is going to be learning a slice of our decision tree, and then in the end, we're going to be merging it together, okay? So today's lecture instead, I want to tell you that you can leverage both data parallelism and model parallelism at the same time, okay? These are the two main uh, aspects where we, we can uh, perform better on large data sets. And as I was saying before, uh, some of these state-of-the-art deep neural net for instance, for visual recognition tasks, they have more than 100 million parameters. Um, a very recent model released by OpenAI, not even a week ago, I think, on language models, um, that has roughly, there's more than a billion parameters, like billion with a B. So these numbers are extremely big, okay? And you can imagine that if you have to maintain a billion parameters and update them in your any kind of gradient descent optimization that you're running, that's extremely hard to scale, okay? So how can we deal with such large models? So first of all, let me tell you what are the three different uh, dimensions where we can uh, scale our, um, our machine learning pipeline. So the first one, we already see it. We already saw it. We, we said that we can leverage data parallelism. So we have more data and then we can split this data among different machines, and like in the case of Planet, each MapReduce worker will be taking care of a, of a slice of the data. The other dimension is the model parallelism. So think about this graph as a, as a neural network. You can see that we're splitting the neural net, or you can think about this being the weights of different SBMs. We're splitting them among different cores. So we're trying to train a part of this network on each different server. And once again, if you think about the number of parameters that I was mentioning to you before, like a billion parameters, then it starts to be necessary to be able to split those models on multiple servers, okay? So this is the model parallelism axis. And the last one is the workload partitioning, which we're not gonna be seeing today, but basically I, I wanna make you understand that uh, 
it is not that easy at the end of the day because there are, there are always some synchronization barrier and, and blocking factors on why this is not an embarrassingly parallel task. For, so once again, if you think of this as a, as a neural network, um, the server two and server four will have to wait for this first stage to finish in order for the data and for the weights to propagate to the next stage. So that's why there is always some kind of workload partitioning involved. So the fact that there will be some blocking barriers between the different steps, okay? But for now, let's focus on data parallelism and model parallelism because this can be all tackled from the theoretical side. While this is more of a systems problem, like we already know how to schedule efficiently tasks on large clusters, okay? Okay, so there is, this is a very quick overview. We have our model, uh, we have servers that can communicate with each other, so we have a full mesh. Uh, servers will have multiple cores. You can think of those as CPUs, GPUs, whatever kind of computational unit uh, that does the job. And we have our training data feeding into our model. So with this kind of architecture, we can, uh, we can work on both unsupervised and supervised objectives. Uh, usually we're gonna be applying what I just explained you, so this mini batch stochastic gradient descent because it's, it's a good trade-off. And uh, the model parameters are gonna be sharded by partition. So basically, as we said before, the model, parts of the model will be residing on one, uh, on each of the servers. And uh, models can scale up to thousands of cores or even more, okay? So this is how a large scale ML architecture looks like. Uh, how are we gonna now to parallelize this process? So, um, here is where parameter servers play a role. And I'm gonna be explaining to you very quickly what is a parameter server. So you, you can imagine that uh, a parameter server basically holds all the weights of your model. They can be SVM weights from our separating hyperplane, they can be neural network weights, wh whatever you like. And at each step, the, the parameter server will communicate uh, the weights to the model, and then the model will communicate back a delta P. So, a change to those weights due to a gradient descent step, okay? And the parameter server updates everything to P prime, and then we go forward and we're gonna be having another step, okay? So basically what a parameter server is, is nothing but a key value store. Uh, keys are the indexes of uh, the model parameters, so let's say the different weights, and the values are the actual parameters of the model, okay? So as I was saying before, maybe these are weights of our neural network. And there are some system challenges to implement something this large. Clearly there is a high bandwidth problem, so all these cores have to communicate together with the parameter server, so they will be getting thousands of updates per second. There is a synchronization issue, as I was saying before, so the model has to block every time a stage is completed. And last but not the least, there is always a fault tolerance issue when you're working with a lot of servers. Servers can get slower, they can crash, and so forth. So whenever you're trying to work at large scale, you always have to take into account the fault tolerance problem, okay? So with a parameter server, what we're actually doing is we're decoupling the problem. We're moving away the parameters from our model, and if one of these servers fails, we can just replace it with another one, and that server will be keep on updating the parameter server, okay? So that's the key insight on why we do it in this way. And so this is uh, now the idea of, yeah, you start to have multiple workers, they're all updating in parallel in our parameter server, and there is a key question that we have to solve right away. How come that these parallel updates are working? So if you remember when we've seen uh, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, we were always uh, doing one update at a time those updates were not happening in concurrently, okay? So all in a sudden, the kind of architecture I'm showing to you here supports concurrent, concurrent updates. And there are either two options. The first option is each update is a blocking update. So you have to, you know, freeze the status of the parameter server, everyone waits for this server to do the update, and then this other server follows, but that defies the parallelism, right? If we put a big lock in front of the parameter server, then it becomes a serial bottleneck, all right? So the other insight is the fact that we can actually update the gradient in parallel concurrently, okay? And this is what enables this class of problems, the fact that you, we can work now with a parameter server that receives concurrent updates. So this was 
a very exciting result uh, from, from eight years ago. So it's how to perform SGD asynchronously. And the key idea is, is baffling for how easy it is, okay? Uh, basically what you do is you don't synchronize, you just overwrite the parameters opportunistically. So first come, first serve, okay? From the multiple workers, and our workers usually are servers, right? And the implementation is exactly the same as the stochastic graded descent, but you just throw away the locking. Um, so the, 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 the legend is the, one of the graduate students working on this uh, piece of research uh, just, you know, out of boredom disabled the locking in his own implementation of SGD, and he found out it was still working. So at first they thought it was a bug, and then it turns out that they work back the theory on why that was actually working, okay? And that's how, you know, Hog Wild, uh, Hog Wild uh, was born, okay? So uh, I recommend you to check this paper, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and what is the main insight, why this is working? So, in theory, uh, they proved that the asynchronous GD is still converging, but at a slower rate than the serial version because there are updates happening in parallel. So you can imagine that they're rewriting each other updates. But it turns out that when the graded updates are sparse, so when we're working with high dimensional data, they almost achieve the same convergence rate, okay? So that's the very fascinating result that they found out. And in practice, this happens pretty much all the time because with this very large model and with large data, um, we always work with high dimensional uh, data, so our updates are gonna be sparse. And when an update is sparse, it just means that we are gonna be updating different components of this parameter server. So that's why there are not a lot of overrides, okay? And as, as you can see from this graph, so uh, Hog will pretty much achieves linear speed up with the number of splits uh, that we're performing on the data, okay? And RR, the one that is uh, completely flat, is a very optimized version of the online gradient descent that, we, that we've seen before, okay? So all in a sudden, throwing more ardor at the problem, we almost achieve a linear scale up. And, you know, uh, this is basically uh, the holy grail of a few years ago for optimization of very large models. So I will guide you very quickly through the, through the pseudocode. Uh, it looks exactly like SGD. The only catch is that you'd perform this partitioning at the beginning, so uh, piece the number of partitions or processes. Then this you will recognize as SGD that we already seen. And the only catch here is that whenever you apply uh, the updates of your gradient, they're component-wise, okay? So you see here, we are taking only the components that are non-zero, right? And this relies, as we said, on the sparsity of the data. So last slide and we are done. Uh, I know that I'm running out of time. So let's put everything together, all the ingredients that we have seen today, the data parallelism, the model parallelism, the asynchronous SGD, and all of a sudden we get basically the architecture that Google published in 2012 called Disbelief or Large Scale Distributed Deep Networks. And this is what's considered usually the dawn of large scale deep learning, okay? That's when Google was able to all in a sudden go from uh, smaller models uh, to something that uh, was able to handle uh, data sets of the size of ImageNet or YouTube or so forth, okay? And the beauty of this thing is that there are very few synchronization steps as we have seen before. It's very robust to slow machines. So as we said before, if one of these servers is failing, there will be someone else performing still the updates on the parameter server and it still makes progress toward finding the minimum of our loss function, okay? So that's all. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. <coughs> yeah? Could you average the gradients coming in? Could you average the gradients coming in from the, you know, to, on the parameter server? Yeah. Uh, yes, but it would be kind of expensive because if you wanna have a full overview of the gradients of different servers, then you're introducing yet an additional synchronization step between them. So they are all to communicate the data on a single server, then you take the average and you perform the update. So in this way, it's as easy as it gets. You don't even average them, you just overwrite. I meant something more like that, um, where it's a running average, where like, Oh, yeah, 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 I understand your question now. Yeah, um, th that's why this works, for instance, with mini-batch gradient descent, because you do the averaging on a single core already. You do work on a small batch, work with that gradient, and then perform an update. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yep. Yeah, just wanted to confirm for the, the SGD, SVM, you cannot use any other kernels in the linear ones. For what we've seen today, yes. Yeah. The, the, there are other ad adaptations on how you can include uh, more powerful kernels, but yeah, uh, l let's not complicate it further. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? Uh, okay, thank you. See you next time.